today, I'm going to introduce you to the future of tooling. I want to talk today about developers, developers, <laughs> developers. We're bringing back front page. We're bringing back front page. We're bringing back Clippy down there. Uh, you can rip out everything else. Clippy's going to write your applications for you. I'm probably going to get fired for that one. All right. <laughs> so the name of this actual talk is not about front page. Some of you are a little sad about that. I know. It's OK. Me too. Uh, called 10 Kilobytes or Bust, The Delicate Power of Webpack and Babel. So I work at this tiny little so uh, startup that uh, Brian alluded to. Uh, it's pronounced Microsoft. <coughs> you might have heard of it. Uh, it's kind of indie. We're kind of in stealth mode still. Uh, and I work specifically on the Azure part of it, which is kind of fun. Uh, <coughs> that's our new mascot, uh, specifically for the Azure part. Uh, Bit, Bit is its name. There are stickers back there. I don't know if they're still out there, but uh, yeah, they're pretty cool. I do this little thing called front of happy hour. Where's, where's Ryan? Did he, did he leave? That asshole. <laughs> uh, so Ryan and I uh, do this podcast whenever I'm in town. Uh, <laughs> called Friend and Happy Hour. It's pretty fun. Uh, it's, you ever see that show, uh, Drunk History? It's Drunk JavaScript. That's exactly what this is. Uh, I do this little thing called Friend and Masters. That's probably why they invite me to do these things. Uh, I, we are about to release V4 of my React course, which I'm really, really stoked about. Uh, I've worked at a couple of these other smaller startups as well. Uh, Netflix. I was literally around here at the corner at LinkedIn for a while. And I was at... Uh, Third and Bryant working at Reddit a while ago. I, I now live in Seattle. Uh, I moved there about six months ago, but yeah, I was here in the Bay for a long time. Uh, I'm originally from Utah, go Jazz. No one's going to woo about that except maybe Jen. I <laughs> uh, lived in Torino for a long time, so I'm a big Juve fan, and uh, now I live in Seattle. Go Seahawks. And this is the, the puppy tax, right? If nothing else, people that you at least saw a cute puppy during this talk, so you got something out of it. Her name's Luna, she's adorable. Okay, so now we're actually going to talk about real things. Uh, it's not just about me, not always. Um, this tweet, uh, some of you may know who tweeted this. Uh, it's okay if you don't, don't bother finding it. Uh, I hate this tweet. <laughs> uh, I'll read it for you. I only ask that frameworks put warnings on their products when they can't be accessible, e.g. this site best viewed with a high net worth. Like, on one hand, I strongly agree with the sentiment here of like, let's build things for the web that everyone can use, right? Like, just because you don't have a fast phone or uh, you, you're not in a place that has great Wi-Fi doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to like, do things on the internet, right? Like, that's one of the great powers that we, we wield is that we can uh, reach all these people uh, in like disparate parts of the world. On the other hand, like we're trying our best, damn it, right? Like, <laughs> no one's going to work because like I'm going to screw over all these people that don't have like good Wi-Fi, right? Like, no one's thinking that except I don't know, maybe someone back there. <laughs> but that's it. Um, like, we're we're just trying to survive. Most of us are like trying not to get fired. <laughs> Most of us are like trying to like just make it to that next like series of funding or whatever, right? Like, no one's out there just trying to. Um, screw people over, right? That's not, not our stated goal here. So not every app needs to work on a, like a 2G device, on a low power phone. And it's up to you to kind of know your audience, right? What do I mean when I say know, to know your audience? If you're building like Uber for helicopters in Manhattan, it's probably okay that it doesn't work on low power 2G Android devices, right? Like I don't know of many like Elon Musk out there with like their flip phone trying to call helicopters, right? Maybe. I don't know. That guy's weird. But <laughs> um, if you're building applications like that, you're probably OK to depend on them having the latest version of iOS or Android or something like that, right? But at the same time, if you're trying to build, like, you know, what refugee camp management software or something like that, you'd, like, you damn well better work on, like, 2G or offline or something like that. And you really need to get into your Google Analytics, right? You should go in and check your analytics and see what uh, browsers are accessing it, how fast they are, what like viewports they're looking at. Because if you're de designing for like your 
designer's like you know, 15,000 inch uh, monitor, it's gonna look crappy on a phone, right? So you need to be kind of optimizing for your audience, something you should really be thinking about. So that said, we're, we're kind of going to talk about 2G on low power devices today. So uh, I'm going to teach you like how to, to optimize for those kind of scenarios and then you, don't, you can kind of decide how much of this stuff you need to do. So uh, just to get some terminology out of the way here, uh, what is 2G when I'm talking about 2G? 2G is 14 kilobits per second, give or take, depending on which technology and how good your reception is. But for the, in, like, the sake of this argument right now, that's what we're talking about. 3G, talking about, uh, when you're talking about CDMA, there's GSM as well, but we're t for CDMA, it's about 144 kilobits per second. 4G LTE, like if you're fully connected on 4G, you get 100,000 kilobits per second. And if you're on gigabit fiber, which I just got in Seattle, which I'm very happy about, you are at a million kilobits per second. So, so that's something to think about. So who remembers browsing the internet? I'm one of these bad boys. I literally had this one. Not, I mean, not literally, but I, at least, whatever, you get my point. <laughs> I remember going to like, like download.com and downloading the Phantom Menace uh, demo game, right? It was, it was like 60 kilobytes or, or six, 60 megabytes or something like that, and I had to leave my computer on overnight so that I could download it, right? Stuff like that. Or like I was burning CDs with my 2X CD burner. I felt pretty, pretty cool about that. So. Remember browsing around the internet and it was just like kind of slow and you'd have to like wait, like you'd like get up to get a drink of water in between page loads? <laughs> right? I remember that. Um, now, back then, those pages were optimized for those kind of browsing experiences because that was as fast as it got, right? 56 kilobytes was flying. Like you, you looked down on the people that had the 14.4 modems, right? <laughs> Maybe like my bias is coming out here. <laughs> I was always a jerk, even as a kid. Um, right, but the, the web at that point was optimized for those kind of slow speeds, right? Like people weren't building big frameworks and like big web applications. Like they were simple pages that were static HTML that was just linking around, right? And it was already slow, <laughs> okay? Now trying to imagine that like, I'm gonna take away all of your devices and all you have is this. This is your only connection to the internet today, right? Do you want to stream Netflix on this? No. Even if you, like, I don't even know if you can. So browsing the net on that, 2G is slower, okay? Like, just think about that for a second, that 2G is slower than browsing the internet today. Like, I, hopefully you're having like these, like, wow, like, I'm glad I never have to do that. It's like, yeah, actually you might. And there are people looking at your products, browsing it like that. So hopefully that can help you kind of reframe in your mind as like, oh man, I, like I need to, I got some stuff I gotta fix, right? So, and the web is so bloated now, right? Like we're shipping frameworks, like even React, I love React, I've been writing React for a long time. <laughs> um, React today is I think like 31 kilobytes, just like out of the box, right? So you're already like in 30 kilobytes just by shipping React. So. I want to do a bit of an experiment now with all of you. I need everyone to like, close their laptops, put down your phones. I will throw this at you if I see you. I see you. <laughs> and I'm going to make you watch linked, you, I'm going to make you watch LinkedIn.com load on 2G. And I want everyone just like eyes on it fixed, right? Don't talk to each other, silence. Okay, you ready? I'm about to hit go. Now, so you can see it is spinning up there. The reason why I chose LinkedIn is I used to work on this, right? So I'm part of the problem here. Okay, we are 12 seconds in and there's literally nothing happening. You're beginning to like question your sanity at this point. It's like, did I hit enter? <laughs> okay, we're 24 seconds in, still nothing, right? You're like, it's probably down, right? It's probably down. Oh, wait, what, what happened here? Oh, we got a loading indicator. <laughs> <laughs> so we are now 40 seconds in and there's absolutely nothing useful on the page. At 43 seconds, now 
we're starting to actually see like real things kind of show up on the page, right? Still not very much useful stuff. Like we got like the headlines, but we don't have anything in our f feed. We're finally starting to load images at like a minute into this, right? <sighs> 1.1 minutes, we're still not done. We're still not even done with everything above the fold. Still loading, so I think we're pretty much done above the fold now at 1.2 minutes in, but we're still loading stuff beneath the fold. And there, 1.3 minutes. All right, you can open your laptop again. <laughs> That's crazy. Like, how many think that any of your users are gonna like stick out for that? Like, most of you are like almost rage quit this talk, right? <laughs> Let alone trying to like browse the internet like this. It's just, it's just a non-starter. Now, like, I want to be totally fair. It's like LinkedIn has other products that, that are more geared toward those kind of audiences. I'm picking on the desktop experience because it's really slow, and it's not React. <laughs> um, that's bad, though. You're going to have like a 99% drop off if this is what your product looks like going out to something like India, right? And like, LinkedIn is a site that a place like India or rural Montana or some of these other places could use, right? Like, it's it's like connecting the world like economic graph. Like we want to connect everybody. We don't want to connect just people that have gigabit internet in San Francisco, right? So I want to just contrast this for a second for you. Um, and we're going to watch a different site load on 2G, exact same speeds. I didn't do anything else differently. We're going to watch Trebo.com, which is a motel chain in India, okay? I'm going to hit go now. Within a second, it's pretty much almost useful, right? And within 7.6, everything above the fold is loaded, and within about 12 seconds, we're done. If you blinked, you kind of missed it, right? It would be like a 12-second blink, but nonetheless. <laughs> that's amazing, right? Like, it's amazing how they were able to take these, like, some of these tactics that I'm going to talk to you about in just a second and do something so radically different, so radically better, right? I find that fan fantastic. So if this is a competition, San Francisco is losing, right? Like, LinkedIn's just right there. Like, you can, like, look out the window and see it, right? This was made in Bangalore. So it's a different audience, right? They're, they're trying to reach, you know, different sorts of people. But nonetheless, like, they're, they're using the technology better than we are in a, in a lot of places. There's a great blog post on Trebo.com from Adi Asmani um, where he actually goes in depth and uh, picks it apart and tells you all the techniques that they used to get that page load to be so fast. Okay, so hopefully, just raise your hand if you feel bad right now. The rest of you are heartless bastards. <laughs> so this is how I feel when I like give this talk. I was like, oh man, like I'm thinking about stuff I just built recently and it's still bad. And this is kind of how I feel when I was like, okay, like I feel like I'm a dog floating in space. I was like, I don't even know where to start, right? <laughs> just kind of drifting. I put this GIF in every talk. It's my favorite one. Because <laughs> most of the time I don't have any idea what I'm doing. So I'm going to give you uh, a bunch of different just tactics and ideas that you can use to kind of get your page loads faster, to get people feeling like your uh, application is nice and zippy. Some of them are going to be very heavy. right? Like switching your framework is obviously a very heavy decision. And some of them are almost free. So it will be varying levels here. Hopefully you'll get something out of this. So the first easy one is question your framework, right? This is a React conference, so I imagine most of you are using React. Um, some of you might consider switching to Preact. Now, Preact's a pretty great uh, uh, application framework. It's almost out of the box, just like React. Don't get me wrong, you are making trade-offs by choosing Preact over React. And I'm happy to go into in-depth on that if, if anyone wants to talk about it. But the, the basic gist is they, re they ripped out the synthetic event system. They ripped out a bunch of other stuff that the, that uh, JavaScript can do faster than the browser today, and they Preact relies on the browser to do it, right? Like the event system, right? It's, it's slower at runtime on some th things, uh, but it is 3.5 kilobytes as opposed to 31.6, right? And so again, if you're building uh, stuff for like refugee camps in Nairobi, it might make some sense to, to switch to Preact, right? 
So that's something for you to think about. Views 21.4, Views is a really awesome framework. You should definitely give it a shot. Um, and Angular is always slimming down. They're down to 61.9 from a lot more than it used to be. But just think about by adding React to your project, you're adding a second to your page load on 2G. Like that should give you some pause, right? Just out of the box, nothing else, no app code, no Axios, no nothing else. You've added a, you already added, you're at a second. You have a floor that you cannot go underneath. That's rough. So definitely give that some thought. Uh, Babel preset M. This is an interesting one. How many? It, I want everyone to like go home after this and check like their production build and make sure that they're not using Babel preset ES 2015. If you are, just please switch off it. Like literally, just change it to be Babel preset M, and uh, you'll be so much better off. And let's let's talk about what. Uh, preset env is. Preset env is basically saying, I want to target the last two major releases of all browsers, right? And it, what it'll do is it'll actually go in and um, pull the latest browser list and say, like, okay, you're going to target like uh, Chrome 69 and 68 and 67, and then it won't transpile any of your other code to, to for those other browsers because those browsers will work with that code, right? And so as they release new and newer and newer browsers, they'll transpile less and less of your code, which is uh, kind of what we want, right? We want to be shipping less transpiled code. So that's what preset env is going to do for you, uh, and definitely something you should switch to today. You should not be using preset ES 2015 at all anymore. In fact, I think if you're still using it, it, it warns you in, your, in the CLI. So. This is kind of an interesting tactic. It was, uh, I think, kind of innovated at, uh, at Google. I know uh, one of my uh, ex-coworkers at LinkedIn and Netflix, Chris Baxter, uh, did a lot of stuff with this. The, the basic idea is that we have this new kind of script type called module, right? And only really new browsers support it. So what you'll do is you'll compile your code twice. If the browser supports that um, module type uh, script, it'll download that first one, and then using some other you know, behind the scenes magic, which you can go read about later if you want to try it, um, if it doesn't support module, then it'll go download the other one, right? And so you can transpile the, the other one for old browsers, and then you can transpile the, one of them for new browsers. So basically you transpile it twice, and you, you let the new browsers get the new code, which I think is uh, pretty cool. Let's talk about tree shaking for a second. So what is tree shaking? Well, tree shaking is the idea that you don't need all of the code from every library. And a great example of this is Lodash, right? How many here sit, would say that like they're using every piece of Lodash? Good, no hands. There's always some jerk in the back like, I do. It's like, no you don't, <laughs> no you don't. Lodash is huge. I think there's like two or 300 methods on it, right? And so the idea that you're shipping all of those methods to, to, to your clients when you don't really need to is kind of ridiculous, right? Like, look at this one, right? Like, uh, underscore dot get, right? And that bundle right there is 73.3 kilobytes of code for two lines of code, right? Now, first of all, that's not gzipped. So if you gzipped it, I think you'd get down to like 15 or something like that. Nonetheless, that's crazy for just what that is. So there's this idea of tree shaking that basically it'll go through and only include the code that could potentially be run. This, so another word for tree shaking is live code inclusion, which is different than dead code elimination, which I think is why tree shaking is a weird name for it, right? But it, tree shaking is live code inclusion. So uh, the only uh, part of Lodash that could get run in here is everything that get depends on. And, and all the other stuff like uh, all the array methods, all the functional programming stuff, all that stuff gets left behind. So this is kind of how you do that. Uh, you have that modules false part that, and I think, oh, I'll talk about that in a second. Modules false part, right? That's the part I want to focus on. You're telling Babel, don't transform my modules, and then either parcel or webpack, whatever you're using, or roll up, will go through, and it'll compile the code in such a way that uh, that other pieces of code can never be reached, and then when you uglify, uglify will detect is like this code could never potentially be run, and uglify will strip it out for you. So you kind of have like this cascading house of cards a little bit with your uh, build process, but it does work. It's pretty cool. So something, another little kind of thing I wanted to talk about 
How many of you have this line in your Babel RCs right now? Like, use the last few versions. I imagine many of you do. It's, uh, it was recommended by the Babel docs for a long time. And I found out this week, this is bad. We shouldn't do this. Why shouldn't we do this? Because it's also saying the last two versions of IE. And it's saying the last two versions of the Baidu browser, which literally no one uses. The last two uh, versions of Internet Explorer Mobile, my favorite browser. <laughs> <laughs> So this one's harmful. You should definitely go and consider stripping this one out, like go check your code and make sure. You <coughs> something really cool that preset env can do for you, which many of you may not realize, is you can actually import your Google Analytics into it, and it'll actually target your particular people, right? So you can actually go out, fetch your Google Analytics, uh, Analytics data, feed that into your build process, and you can say target 99% of my users, and it'll just transpile it just for your users. Pretty cool, right? So there's other things you can do. You can say like 1% of global audiences, 1% of US, somewhere. so there's a bunch of things that you should do and not this one. So that's one to fix right now. Modules false, this is the other one I was talking about that you don't want Babel to transpile your modules. How am I doing on time? 20 minutes, cool. So going back to the, our Lodash tree shaking example, if you switch to Lodash, dash ES, which is uh, Lodash repackaged for ES modules, and you import just get, you go from having a 73.3 kilobyte bundle to down to having an 11.1, .1, right? Massive difference, almost for free. In fact, what I want to show you here is this is what your bundle looks like if you're using the Lodash dash ES and just pulling out get, right? This is what it looks like if you pull in everything, right? Did you, it's a slight difference, did you catch it there? <laughs> You're pulling in a bunch of stuff, right, that you just don't need. So definitely go in and check out uh, how to do tree shaking. A lot of times it's really simple to get uh, set up with uh, existing build processes. Now, tree shaking is no silver bullet. Come on, I think I'm funny. <laughs> it's no silver bullet, why is it not a silver bullet, right? If you try and tree shake React, you're not gonna tree shake very much out of React because React pretty much is almost entirely used, right? There's like little pieces maybe here and there that you can tree shake out of React, but for the most part, you need all 30 kilobytes of React to get React working. And furthermore, you can't really tree shake your own code because hopefully you're not writing code that's never used. <laughs> so, it's only gonna be useful for things that like Lodash, um, RxJS, some of these other ones that, uh, that you don't need the entire uh, library for. Use built-ins, this is another really interesting one and we are now officially on stable Babel 7 so I can fully recommend people do this now. Uh, up until this point, I, this is kind of been speculative but now uh, you should all consider upgrading to Babel 7. Uh, let's talk about use built-ins. This is one of the newer, exci more exciting features of uh, Babel 7 here. So let's just look at a.js there. So var e a equals do promise, right? And imagine you are shipping to a user that does not have promises in their browser, right? And you're using it in your application. You can see the output right there is imports core JS modules es6.promise. And what this takes advantage of is it takes advantage of the fact that Webpack and Parcel are smart enough to only include that polyfill once. So it actually will only import that one particular polyfill instead of importing all of polyfill.js, which is quite large, right? So this is a, a really, really great way to get some free web performance out of this um, and to kind of tree shake some of those polyfills out that you don't necessarily need. And then if you move into an environment now that like you're shipping to users that all support promises, you can see down there at the bottom, you don't ship the polyfill ever. So use built-ins usage, that's, that's the new one. You should definitely consider using that. Loose mode. Loose mode is, I feel <coughs> people kind of get like bent out of shape about loose mode. So loose mode's been around in Babel, at least since Babel 5. Uh, and the idea behind loose mode is that most of us are not doing insane things with uh, the new features in JavaScript. And, and a good, good example of that would be classes, right? Classes are pretty complicated 
and they have some crazy edge cases if you start trying to like use symbols together with classes inside of proxies, right? Like you can get into some pretty backward stuff. They have to define how that stuff works, right? Because they don't want you to like break because the language can't handle it, right? So they define all these edge cases for it, but they're things that you're never going to run into unless you're doing stuff like that, right? So the idea behind loose mode is that look, we're going to assume that you're just gonna use classes like a normal person, right? And you're not gonna try and mix it together with all that kind of stuff. So we're not going to ship you all of the crazy edge case code and we're going to ship you the 99% use case of this. And I'm, actually, it's probably 99.99% .99 use case. So here's an example of that. This is uh, classes here. Uh, the one on the left is like the not loose mode, right? The uh, the full polyfill for it, and the one on the right is the loose mode polyfill for it. So you're just not including a bunch of stuff, and if you transpile in loose, uh, loose mode, you, you're gonna cut out maybe, I don't know, I'm gonna guess like 10 to 20% of those polyfills at least. In this case, you're cutting out almost 50%. So, pretty cool. Uh, I've been using loose mode the entire time I've been writing Babel, or using Babel, and it's literally never been a problem for me. So I, I would suggest ch consider switching to loose mode. <sighs> Anyone here work at Slack? Okay, cool, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shame Slack for just a second. <laughs> uh, Slack infamously shipped React in development mode, right? Does anyone remember that? Um, React in development mode is like four times larger, it's uh, like six times slower, and it ha like has a bunch of useful debugging stuff, like being able to plug into the dev tools and having useful error messages and a bunch of stuff like that. It's meant to be like a really great development experience. Never ship that to production. So make sure you're building React with Node MV equals production, and because this is a React conference, uh, every one of you needs to go check to make sure that that is happening. Please, please, please do that. So, yes. Please build using Node equals production. It's literally free web performance. Code splitting. Uh, we'll uh, gloss over this a little bit. Uh, the next talk is about it, but the idea is that you can split out code bundles, right? And it, <coughs> if you're trying to get under 10 kilobytes, hence the name of the talk, you need to be doing code splitting, so you should definitely pay attention to the next talk. Source maps. Uh, please don't ship inline source maps, I think is my plea to you today. If you do uh, inline source maps, you are going to balloon your bundle by at least 4x, right? The idea behind source maps being is that I'm writing JSX, and I wanna see in my dev tools the JSX code, I don't wanna see the compiled code, right? So you ship source maps. A really easy and convenient way of doing that is just to write those in line from your build tool, and I've seen way too many companies ship source maps in line, so please go make sure that you are not shipping source maps in line. Let's talk about scope hoisting a little bit. This is kind of a fun feature from uh, our good friends over at Rollup and Webpack, and I think Parcel now, I'm not sure about Parcel, but definitely Webpack is do doing now as well. So that's the sign for Rollup. Uh, if you're building libraries, definitely consider using Rollup. I think it's a really cool library. Uh, React, for example, is built using Rollup. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, I think we're beyond this now, so y there used to be something that you would include called module concatenation pr plugin for Webpack. If you're on older versions of Webpack, you might still need to use it, uh, but if you're on the new versions of Webpack, pretty sure it just happens automatically. So let's talk about what this is. It's pretty subtle, and I want you to look at line four on the, on the left here, which is the var helper equals Webpack require method zero. That carries a bit of overhead. So that's the internal plumb plumbing of how React, or sorry, of how Webpack is doing these requires. So it actually has to go in and bring this uh, kind of heavy thing into the scope and then execute it. However, with scope hoisting, basically what you're doing there is like line four on the right, where you're bringing that helper actually in line, and so when it goes to invoke the helper on line nine, or line seven on the left, um, it's actually calling it directly out of the scope that it's in, right? And so it, while this looks like it might, like it wouldn't make a big difference, for the actual execution, the actual web performance of your code, it's gonna go out significantly faster. So you you're actually will notice large speed ups by doing scope hoisting. Let's talk about image skeletons. These are kind of fun. So image skeletons are the idea that you have 
big images on your page and you have like these big backdrops or maybe you're doing like you know, the New York Times and you have these kind of like big kind of hero images inside of your application. And you have these images that are gonna be, you know, even if you optimize, they're gonna be 500 kilobytes or, or something to that extent. Well, there's an idea here that you could load skeletons first, like load these kind of like pre-images to kind of hold the space until they can go later and load the images. Now keep in mind, not all kilobytes are created equal, right? JavaScript kilobytes are very expensive in the sense that they have to be downloaded, parsed, and executed. Whereas an image just has to be downloaded and then the browser is real good at displaying images, right? So it's not apples to oranges here. If you cut out 500 kilobytes of images, it's not the same as cutting out 500 kilobytes of JavaScript, not even close. But I wanted to just show you some of these. In fact, uh, Gatsby today do, does some of these techniques just for you, so which I think is pretty cool. So the images on the right are the full fidelity images. The one in the middle is using 100 shapes and SVGs, and the one on the left is doing just 10 uh, shapes. The one on the left is literally on the order of bytes, right? You can ship that SVG and it's really tiny. The one in the middle is, I think it's like a kilobyte or something like that, and the one on the right I think is like 500 kilobytes or 400 kilobytes or something like that. So the idea here is that you would load one of these, right? You do some pre-processing step to kind of approximate what these images look like, Particularly that one in the middle is actually pretty damn close, right? And then as soon as that image actually finishes loading, you would then overlay that new image on top of it, right? And again, there's a Gatsby plugin, if you're, any of you are using Gatsby, uh, that just does it for you. It's really cool. I like this one. I'm pretty fascinated with this one as well. So you'll actually go in and like, kind of create like a shadow outline of it, and then you'll just load that, and then once the image loads, it just kind of blurs in. These ones were done by hand, uh, but I'm sure if one of you wanted to go do some sort of like edge detection or something like that, this could be written as well. And this is a personal favorite of mine as well. It's really easy to animate paths with SVG, so why couldn't you just animate those in as well? Right? <laughs> it's kind of eye-catching. I'll let those cycle through because they're pretty cool. So hopefully that's kind of giving you some ideas of like, uh, various ways that you could like load these images beforehand, right? Because then you can optimize the hot code paths first, right? Like you can optimize showing them the titles, the nav, everything that's above the fold, and you can defer loading of those images until later. So you can do placeholder images, you can do just boxes to let people know like there's eventually gonna be an image here, uh, some sort of solid color, or famously I think Facebook does the blur up, right? Where they have like a really blurred version of your photo that's gonna be like, a couple kilobytes and they'll blur up into the, uh, your image that you actually have. How many slides do I have left here? Uh, let's see. Cool. You can cut out a lot of page weight. So this is just an example repo that I went to and the where I was including all the images in line and I was able to cut out two kilobyte or two megabytes just by deferring the loading of all these images. So here's kind of my suggestion for you, just kind of like, like recap. Initial payloads should be under 10 kilobytes. If we're talking about React, you probably want to be under 40, right? That's kind of, you have, that gives you 30 kilobytes to get React in there and then 10 kilobytes to, for your like first layer application code. Uh, load no scripts and only the bare styles to, to get the above the fold visuals going. Use image skeletons um, use, and you really need to use code splitting. Um, which is a really, really important part about this, about deferring everything that you don't need until after the first page load. And then if you're doing code splitting, you can go ahead and use service workers to kind of hurry and load stuff in the background. So I'm gonna give you as well some, a couple tips for doing functions better. So if you're, this, most of this applies as well to AWS Lambdas or your GCP functions. I'm just gonna talk about Azure because you're a captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> So in here we're gonna be talking more about reducing time to first byte, right? Like you wanna have these functions run really, really fast. So server timings API, this is really cool. It's really easy to drop this in. Basically you can send down, it's like, hey, hitting my database took this long, I took this long on the processor, and you can kind of attach that information as a header to requests so you can actually see those inside of the dev tools, right? I think this is inside of Chrome. You can see that I was taking, you know, 600 milliseconds on the file system, 900 milliseconds on you know, MySQL sharding and that kind of stuff. And you can see, you can diagnose backend problems from within your browser. Or basically you, you can tell the backend developer that they suck and you have proof, right? 
That's what I'm going for. Oh man, compress your responses. Is anyone in here for work for LinkedIn? Cool. Let's shame LinkedIn for a second. Uh, we're in a Microsoft office. <laughs> uh, when I got to LinkedIn, one of the first things I was just kind of combing through and seeing where I could cut down on things, and I noticed none of the API responses were being g compressed at all. They were just being sent down raw. And like gzipping your responses to the API, it's, it's just free web performance. It's just free. Please, everyone, go check all of your uh, API responses and make sure that they're getting compressed. Please. It's just, it's just silly that that wasn't happening. So here, uh, just to show you how big a, a difference compression can make, this is ridiculous, but I, I was doing it to prove a point. I got 73.28 kilobytes compressed to 241 bytes. No, obviously, normally it's not going to be that big a difference, but it can be a massive difference. Broadly, the, the uh, support for Broadly is getting better. It's a different way of doing compression. It is a trade-off that um, it takes a lot longer to compress things in Broadly than it does in gzip, so just be aware of that. And when I say a lot, like significantly longer. But LinkedIn was able to get some pretty big performance wins with that. You can see there, particularly in the US where the people are generally using the evergreen browsers, they were able to shave quite a bit of time off that P90 uh, late, excuse me, performance, and they're e able to see some difference in India as well. So definitely check out Broadly. The support for it is, is great and getting better. It's pretty much in all of the evergreen browsers now. So now that we have Safari 11, uh, pretty much everyone supports it. So 65% of the US, 70% globally support Broadly, and that was as of uh, maybe a month ago. Cold start, it's always a problem with uh, uh, lambdas and functions. It, the idea is that when you're not using your function, we're not going to charge you for having your function spinning. So we actually spin down the servers and we spin it back up whenever someone makes another request, right? So if you have uh, some s sensitivities to some sort of function that doesn't get run often, uh, you'll have to worry about cold start. And uh, like all the providers are terrible about it, us included. So there's a couple tips to kind of uh, get that to be faster. One of them is this thing called Azure Function Pack. We forked Webpack to build functions to be run in Node, so you don't have to go through the Node resolution of modules, which is slower than you might imagine. Um, and that's really important, so using Azure Function Pack is, uh, is really, really great. And the other one is, if it's really important that it never spins down, well, you can create another function that calls that function on some sort of time basis. I know it's ridiculous, but it works. <laughs> and then it will never spin it down, right, because it keeps getting called. So that's another one you can do. Let's talk about the future. That's the greatest gift, right? I got a couple minutes here, so let's hurry through these. Uh, we want to do loose mode automatically, uh, ahead of time compilation, something called Angular Ivy is something worth keeping an eye on, partial evaluation, prepack, if you've heard of that, go to prepack.io. Uh, basically, the, the, the big win here is that it'll do all these kind of things that it can do ahead of time. So you can see that it'll actually run the Fibonacci on the server and compile it down so you can, you're getting just the number. Uh, I actually went through and they're doing it specifically for React. So you can actually pre-compile your Webpack or your uh, React app. So you can see uh, on the right, line eight and line nine, it's actually gone through and pre-evaluated your React app to be much simpler than having classes and functions and stuff like that. So that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Disappearing frameworks. Uh, Svelte is another one to keep an eye on. Uh, binary bytecode from Glimmer and Svelte as well, like actually having that kind of thing uh, in the sense that they're shipping ones and zeros to your clients and not like actual JavaScript code and you have some sort of VM that runs it. That's kind of the basis of Glimmer. And Hacker News Clone, this is kind of like the new to-do app, so definitely go check that out. Um, and thank you. All right, thank you, Brian.